Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, sir. I know like it's a it's a bit of a weird thing to always hear you give an intro because uh, I feel like I sat in that class like literally two years ago without revealing my age. I'm not going to really say how many years that is, actually, but it literally feels like two years ago. Uh, but yeah, um, in terms of my career and what I primarily write about, it's the A&D industry, architecture and design. And um, unfortunately, my industry is also one of the biggest polluters. So climate change, sustainability, um, greenwashing, these are topics that I routinely write about. And what essentially I was hoping to do with this session was talk about, you know, just give you a brief overview of how, what to look out for, what to really think about when you're writing for uh, sustainability, what are the challenges? Because I think it's always great to go with, um, you know, so much ideas and things like that, but it's also understanding what ideas are feasible. And when I say that, I don't mean like, oh my God, there are limitations and things like that, but it's understanding like within the region, because again, uh, context within the region, what can you report, where are the resources, etc. So I'll, I'll get a little bit more in depth as I go through the slides. Um, and feel free, uh, sir, to like, let me know if I'm like droning on about like a particular slide, because you know how much I love to talk. Um, so starting off, obviously, this is specifically to the A&D industry, talking about the importance of writing for sustainability, the challenges associated with it, best practices when you're approaching a sustainability and you know uh, anything related to that particular side of things and finally obviously effective writing and you know some examples that i think are really really good um so introduction is obviously right now at we are at a crux in time when we are like you know sustainability is the topic we have to address it and for the past 10 years we've been using that term i would say loosely to say anything and everything is sustainable right um in if you look at sustainability from like 10 years ago from that perspective you're looking at it from like oh using of wood and like moving away from plastics and so on and so forth but now we know it's not that linear and it's more uh, complex and there is a lot more nu nuance to like you know sort of understanding the relationship with sustainability uh, using green elements, etc. So within the architecture industry, one of the primary um, issues that we have uh, is while construction, you know, while constructing things, how do you ensure that things are sustainable? How do you make sure that there is a correct log of uh, the logistics of things and uh, where is something shipped from? Like, how is the energy utilized? And, you know, so and so forth. So I think any industry when you approach and when you think about writing for sustainability, the first thing you need to understand is who are you writing for? And more importantly, what are the nuances within that industry? So within the A&D industry, obviously, like I said, materials, uh, where are you sourcing your products, so and so forth. But maybe within the design industry, it's a little bit more different. It's with uh, labor as well, because sustainability also have now has sort of like now expanded to include human resources as well. So that's all about the introduction or thinking about like, you know, the holistic perspective um, of any kind of industry that you're looking at. Now, I'm going to be talking a lot more again, like I said, about the architecture and design industry. So a little bit of background information is that, you know, climate change, sustainability, these are two words that we use a lot. But it's important to understand climate change is very specific to like the temperatures and, you know, you're talking about the precipitation, weather formations, etc. So in that context, these are not words that you can interchange and like, you know, use um, has and when you think is required it has a lot more context to it when you write um, articles as such and when you talk about sustainability it's obviously making sure whatever the needs of the present are met without you know sort of like uh, taking away from future generations so there is sort of that balance and then you have you know some terms that I've not really mentioned here but when you talk about carbon neutrality when you talk about zero carbon emissions these topics have sort of become like a buzzword of sorts where, you know, people sort of promote their products within any sort of industry. Now, within the A&D industry, architecture and design industry, you even have certain tables being labeled as uh, zero carbon. Now, it's easy for us to say, oh, we can keep questioning, like, where where is the, uh, you know, supply chain? Where is the starting material? How can it be? And there's much debate about zero carbon because essentially what you're saying is you're utilizing certain products but you're you know carbon offsetting it and like there are a lot of like what do you say trick words that people use so it's always interest it's always actually important um 
to sit down with whoever you're speaking and ask them to explain the term because how they're using it might not necessarily be the definition that you're thinking about. Um, thinking about carbon neutrality, carbon offsetting, etc. And now, in obviously, the importance of writing for sustainability, we know that it is crucial. Um, our, the planet is basically dying, not to put a damper on like this whole conversation. We are losing resources and uh, inevitably 2050 is going to be the end of the world. But we are trying to negate that. We are trying to stop that from happening, which is why we are talking about this. We're talking about this particular topic and we are having conversations around that. And one of the key challenge when you're writing about sustainability that you will often encounter, not just within this region, but more so within this region is the lack of information. And when I say lack of information, like, for example, I would get a press release today that says like, you know, so and so building is being built in certain place i'm being very ambiguous because i don't want anyone to hold me to anything <laughs> any project and they can say that you know it is lead certified it's well certified it's green building certified but back end of it how was it the certification process done what were the materials that were taken into consideration how were these products you know sourced because as we all know this region does not have a lot of natural materials when it comes to building uh, or construction uh, reasons as such so mapping that out understanding that journey was it really um, the best possible route was it sourced uh, ethically uh, you know in terms of the location but also in terms of human labor etc um, so these are questions that sometimes you don't really find the answer to so how you sort of navigate that challenge is by making sure that you have a transparent conversation with whoever you're talking to about what essentially they want to promote. Um, if they're talking about LEED certification. Now, LEED, uh, L-E-E-D, is one of the platinum certifications that buildings get when they attain a certain level of sustainability, etc. Now, there are two types of, there are two sides um, fighting it out, saying that one side says that LEED certified is the end all. Like that means the building is green. The other side says it's sort of like a checkbox list. Now, you have uh, you as a journalist, when you approach that story, it's worth asking what sort of LEED certification is that? And LEED is an international certification. So it will definitely have a lot more resources in the back end of it um, or, you know, resources from its international body. So it's great to always rely on those kind of stuff. See how much you can sort of understand and build on it. But I will say there are challenges when it comes to certain things because um, in terms of amount spent, in terms of like natural materials used, you do hit a wall. And that is one of the key challenges. You know, lack of in, uh, transparency, I would say, is one. But the other most thing is the lack of information as well. Because, for example, if you look at the architecture and design industry, I am so sorry, that's my mail. <laughs> I'm going to close that yeah so when you look at the architecture and design industry it's always broken down into sectors now we have the residential sector we have the hospitality sector we have the um you know retail sector so and so forth now to get information on residential sector is easy because it's an individual project the architect has very clear connection with it they know exactly how much amount of water will be used in that uh, particular space what's the capacity litter capacity etc now, if you're looking at the hospitality sector, it's a little bit difficult because this region is known for its extremely amazing five-star hotels, and there isn't sort of a limit or a green limit to it. So architects are necessarily at a loss. So when they say a building is LEED certified, but the inhabitants are going to go ahead and use like three liters of water every day, it doesn't, it sort of like breaks the point. And you sort of have to think about that critically and ask that question as well about is there a way to monitor it or is there a way to sort of understand if, uh, you know, the electricity usage or the energy usage is sort of like, you know, uh, recorded just for the architect's, you know, case study. And most, more than often you'll get an answer, but it, it's going to be off the record, which is fine because that's for you to understand and then build on when you move to the next story. And potentially you will hit a client who's going to be like, you know what, I don't care about <laughs> what people think. Here is my stats and list. It happens. Once in a blue one, it happens. And it is gold because you keep going back to that person. And that's why they do it as well, because they want you to come back to them and ask more questions. So I think um, being critical is not something that is looked down upon, but definitely do not be aggressive because one of the incidents that happened um, 
as you all know, BIA, which is uh, Sharjah's, one of the biggest structures in Sharjah, iconic in design, iconic in sustainability, a lot of firsts and all that wonderful things. At the press meet of it, when we had um, the press preview of it, one of the key things that they told about the BIA is that it is a sustainable structure. Now, your question is, how is it sustainable? Can you list out the points? It's LEED certified, well certified, great, 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 great. You write down, you understand as much as you can. At one point, they will say that that information is not available to the public, which means that is a wall and a way to say no, they are not ready to give you any more information. We had another media person who literally said, but how can you say this is sustainable? So the minute you phrase that question, you're burning bridges. You can't really say, you can't go with sort of that aggressive journalism wherein you're like, you know, tell me exactly how this <laughs> building is sustainable. It is not going to be those 60 uh, minutes interview kind of a thing. It has to be more sort of like you're through your networks, understanding if you have, uh, you know, building relationships with any of the other architects who are involved, reaching out to them for uh, reaching out to them for information and like sort of figuring that out, you know, and seeing making sort of like a compromise between how can you talk about it in the most authentic way possible. Um, it does not mean limitations, again, does not mean that you resort to PR and you talk about everything in a fluffy way. You have to do your research. And trust me, architects who are big in the industry, who has a sort of like an international uh, base as well, they are more often impressed with hard hitting questions. And even if they might not give you the answer the first time around, the second project, they're definitely waiting for you to uh, ask that, those exact questions because they might have got their answers approved from the head office. So keep asking those questions, but make sure this is a place which is a lot more relationship based. So make sure you expand your network as well when you ask those questions and you ask to multiple people as well. And so you get your information. Another thing, sorry. There you go. Uh, another best practice when it comes to uh, reporting is that always so do your I, research. I have just one quick note. Um, I just read an article uh, about writing for sustainability, and I and I also I think heard a podcast as well, which spoke about that it's sometimes important to. Uh, I mean, it's about how how you connect with uh, you know the people, for example. Uh, because ultimately, at the end of the day, you are talking to the people and you want them to be more sensitive toward uh, issues on. So this whole idea of gloom and doom, that the world is coming to an end. How hopeful <laughs> and how um, optimistic do you think the writing needs to be so that we can we cannot we cannot dissuade people from just even talking about it? Because if we reach a point where there's no point, yeah, <laughs> you know, like the world is coming to an end. So there's what is the point of doing <laughs> this? You know, so. How would you how would you grapple with that particular challenge? It's like honestly, I feel like it's like watching a zombie movie, and you you feel like oh my god, at the end of the movie, like the world is going to end, and then you still go back and watch another zombie movie because you keep wa wanting to like talk about it and figure out like you know how to es escape the zombies necessarily. So I think in terms of writing for sustainability, emotions need to be kept a little bit at bay because the thing with emotions is the minute you get really um, passionate, which is great if you're passionate about sustainability. But when you start listening or when you start quoting down people who are like, sustainability is the need of the hour. It has to be implemented. It has to be in the DNA of the, f you're going to be like, oh, I'm checked out. Like I've heard the same line 10 million times. I don't want to hear it from another interviewee. The best thing to do in that, those cases are take a little bit of a unbiased approach, be realistic about it as well. There's an interesting conversation where um, Norman Foster, uh, the head of Foster and Partners, one of the biggest architectural firms, he actually went out and said, steel is sustainable. And that was sort of like, wait a second, what steel? He's talking about steel. And like he had a great argument against why steel is sustainable. So it's worth noting and, you know, thinking about those kind of new angles, angles which, you know, even plastic. Can, is there a way for plastic to be sustainable? Maybe if it is 3D printed, maybe, maybe not. Like how, how long is the usage going to be? Um, if it's going to stay for a hundred years and it's a product, does it make sense? So I think it's really important to find those new angles of conversation to stay hopeful because we don't want to hear the same about using wooden straws uh, 
or like paper straw, sorry, not wooden, paper straws or whatever. Because right now it's like, you know, you drink from a paper straw and it sucks. You know that it's going to be bad. So what's the alternative? What new angle are you going to find? Um, if you're talking about like within the architecture and uh, interior design industry, it was something for, I think like five years back, the conversation was about UAE developing its own sort of um, certification program. And then that sort of happened. And then Saudi developed its, uh, so it's Estadama with Dubai, UAE, and then it's Mostadam with Saudi Arabia. They developed their own certifications. So that's a great angle and a conversation starter because it sort of propels, um, you know, a lot more uh, analysis of the of the cultural side of things. What else are you taking into consideration? Um, what other materials, local materials are you using? Because anytime something new comes, there's a lot more research and um, in-depth, uh, yeah, in-depth research that goes into it. So it's always interesting to find a new angle. I would say keep finding those new angles or even if it's a conversation that has been happening for like 20 million years, find a, find a new perspective to it. Find a person who you would least likely think would be the sustainable person and talk to that person. If there is someone who is still a big promoter, like for example, Norman Foster, who says it's steel, talk to that person and find out what, why is it that it is the steel industry and what does the steel industry feel about it? You know, are they li literally like in alignment with him? Is it the same with other architects? It's always interesting to create debates based on actual points as opposed to using the same lines again and again, because that's the biggest sort of issue that people have had with sustainability, because for the longest time, sustainability was associated with words like organic, organic food, clean living, and all these words seemed very elitist. And so the common or like the, the average buyer or consumer felt sort of like that the sustainability is so far away from their daily life, like it doesn't make sense for them to. And it sort of had a reverse effect where people were like, talk to the corporations first, then talk to us as a con consumer. You know, I mean, I'm buying a Big Mac with straws, plastic straws, ask the uh, McDonald's company to change their way of thinking. So I think it's really important to stay away from that kind of a conversation where you're falling into those same rhetorics, you know, uh, organic, clean living. The number of times I've heard the word organic with like, it, it's not even used in the right context. It, and at one point you have to just be like, okay, just who are you fooling right now? <laughs> like, you know, so just ask those questions. Trust me, most of the time, if you ask the right questions in and build those relationships, you will have better angles because, you know, press uh, uh, PR agents or uh, agencies, they want to help you find that new angle as well because they want the promotability of the, of the product, of the firm, of the brand, whatever. So the more you have those conversations, the more those kind of uh, new angles will come into play. So that's how you keep the conversation fresh and, you know, uh, hopefully it doesn't die down. Because it was interesting that um, somebody said at one of the uh, one of the panel discussions that uh, I had, somebody bought up uh, Expo and it, it was a very interesting case study where he said, my biggest, and this was this was one of the people who I said, like, you know, doesn't care what other, anyone thinks, fact is fact, this is the truth. So he literally spoke about how, um, Expo had all these temporary projects or buildings and they sort of had to be broken down and was that really the most sustainable thing to do like you know and so he said the best thing for us to do now is look to the next edition the Osaka edition that's happening and say that this is what we found figure out before you build the projects which projects are going to be broken down which are going to be modular and which are just going to sustain as well so that the builders ahead of time build it to that capacity because there was this particular installation in the spanish pavilion which was made out of marbles now moving of marbles itself is hectic energy time consuming human resources all of it and then they just literally broke it down and took it back again so there is not really much of a point in actually involving in those kind of practices so it's always great to have conversations with people about projects that are completed and projects that are you know about to take place their next project as well thank you thank so, you i mean I, I don't want to like derail you from your uh, flow so yeah so <laughs> I, I wanted to ask that question. 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> For it. Um, so, yeah, in terms of like the best practices, that's exactly what I was talking about. Like in terms of tone as well, it's it's always important. Don't be preachy or judgment. Your um, your audience is not there to be uh, preached to if, if they want to do that or if they want to hear a preachy um you know seminar they'll go to a mosque or a church and that's all fine so try to be as unbiased as possible uh try to i i find personally i think humor is a great uh you know silence breaker and more importantly it's a great like way to get more exclusives and more uh inside information because they'll be like oh the funny person oh yeah of course like let's talk more about it and they get really into the conversation and they'll slip out like a lot of interesting things which you can be like oh by the way that was really interesting that you mentioned like can we actually do a story on that and then then they think out twice about like oh that was off the record or like oh that's interesting like let's continue forward so i think humor is great in building relationships maintaining relationships and more importantly getting a lot of uh, information on things that seem very heavy or uh, would otherwise seem very um, sort of like you know controversial uh, for the lack of a better word so that's one and then in terms of um, these are a couple of things it goes back to the same thing make sure whenever you get a press release because here you get press releases you get like conversations make sure people are not taking you for a ride by saying, you know, lead certified, well certified, certified this, certified that, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many certifications right now. And um, I guarantee you half of the people don't know what they're talking about because the minute you ask them, okay, how was it certified? How was the process? It will be like, oh, let me get back to you on that. <laughs> let me see how much of information I can let you know on that. So always ask follow-ups. Ask them how it was done. Uh, who actually did it? Was it an international body in accordance with local government? Uh, or was it a local government? If so, what are the factors that they looked at um, in 10 years? And also uh, always ask about the future as well. If for the A&D industry specifically, if it's a project, always talk about like 10 years down the line, how is it going to be like, is it going to be remodeled? Is there going to be massive changes in the building? Is there renovations going to be done? Uh, if not, what are the elements that will stay? What are the elements that will go? Uh, because more than often, uh, LEED, which is one of the certifications, like I mentioned, for the building, they get certified based on like, you know, air quality, ventilation, chairs, furnitures as well. So if, for example, you get certified, but like, something massive happens and fifth year your whole furniture breaks then technically you're not lead certified but on paper you are so ask those questions you know how was it certified uh, who certified it which international body and like i said with international bodies information is a little bit more easy uh, easy i mean it's easier to get access to those info so always ask for those follow-ups as well so sorry yeah that was what i was talking about even global perspective as well and it's always good to compare sectors wise uh, globally. So if you have like hospitality, compare it to a global sector, see what are the information that are missing and then, you know, uh, fill in the blanks basically. And yeah, now it's uh, more about the effective terms of writing. Like I said, you can always, you can always break down a project or a story to understand the human connection because the human connection is one of the most important parts of uh, storytelling. And if you have a project that, for example, if you're talking about the Atlantis Resort, how was it built? What was the story behind it? If you think about uh, W Hotel, Mina Seahi, the one in uh, Media City, that had a beautiful journey of, you know, uh, basically they were inspired by the journey of uh, travelers and how they used to travel before to the Arabian regions, etc. So always look for those kind of stories and then build from there. It's a nice way to get everyone's attention, your readers' attention, and then you can get into like the deeper, more difficult conversation. Don't start off with "you are polluting the world" or "this project is that." You know those clickbaity ones. Trust me, clickbaits are the bane of journalism. They have reduced journalism to almost. Um, a Twitter post, like that's how bad it is. So avoid clickbaits. Of course, with any publication, you will be demanded to do a few. But again, make sure if it's a clickbaity one, if they are forcing you to do that has a headline, make sure at least the body has something to offer. Because the last thing you want to do is click on something and find out there's absolutely nothing. 
And a click is more valuable right now than anything else, because essentially it will determine if your audience will stay with you, if they will have trust in you, or if they will literally forsake you for generations. Um, because that's the social media landscape right now. So it's a fun place and fun time to be in media industry. Um, another example is obviously intersectionality. Always talk about articles um, with an intersectional angle. So if you're talking about sustainability, talk about heritage as well. What heritage elements uh, of design can help with sustainability? There was a very interesting uh, topic that was started, I think, almost six, seven years ago about the wind towers um, in the Marathi culture or the, the Khariji culture and how that contributed a lot to airflow and like it was a passive uh, way of being sustainable, etc. And that was a very interesting piece that even we have discussions till day about, you know, how to incorporate that in a large scale effect or the mashrabiya uh, design. How is that helping with, you know, the flow of sunlight, heat, uh, uh, you know, retention, uh, etc. So these are interesting conversations to always have. Always talk about intersectional uh, topics uh, or have intersectional conversations. And then this is basically more or less of what I did mention. Humanize the story because if it is going to be the the funniest thing is even the biggest, baddest corporate uh, brand or firm can be humanized to make it look like the hero of the day. So literally find out what's the motivation of that particular company or brand or design firm. Why are they doing it in this particular way? Norman Foster, like I said, he got a lot of backlash for saying steel was sustainable. But that's because people just took literally that headline and ran with it for like God knows how long. But if you actually read the whole transcript of his interview, which is there in um, Dezeen, D-E-Z-E-E-N uh, website, he's actually making a great case study for uh, uh, saying that, you know, the existing buildings, if they can be maintained instead of being broken down and built again, then there is a case for steel to be sustainable. And it's an interesting conversation. And I think more than anything, it it takes you away from saying that, oh, if you're building only with so-and-so, you're sustainable because it's a new perspective and a new angle. Um, obviously, use visuals, get as much visuals as you can. Storytelling now is incomplete without any visuals. Uh, the more multimedia-centric uh, it is, the better. Uh, Savasar is a great example of that, and he can, I'm sure, tell you more about actually usually, uh, utilizing multimedia to great effect. Um, it, it really won... Putting a face in front of the camera is, it's great for the ego, but more importantly, it also humanizes your subject and it gives more um, accountability. The minute you just put like, there is this sort of trend, and I'm sure most of you must have seen it online as well, putting few pictures and text in. That doesn't really work anymore because it can really devalue a story. It's always nice to have a certain human voice, if not the face, a voice at least, sort of narrating it and taking you through the story. Because as human beings, we still love the art of storytelling, someone telling us a story and hearing that. And, you know, uh, so always go for um, multimedia uh, storytelling versions where it has a, a nice mix of visuals of the project, if it is uh, architecture and design industry, text, and also someone's voice or some sort of like quotes or something being uh, audible as well. Connecting the dots, obviously, when you, it's a complex issue. When it's a complex issue that you're not really sure about, do not be afraid to ask stupid questions or what you assume to be stupid questions. There are no dumb questions. That's first thing. But second and most, ask questions. Ask, why is it? If you don't understand a term that someone has sent across in a press release or, you know, in their press briefing, ask about it. Just genuinely say, can you please break it down to uh, down for me in layman terms? Uh, explain it to me in Tom and Jerry terms. Like literally ask those questions. Do not shy away. Uh, do not think that, oh, my God, if I ask the question, it might make me seem less intelligent or any of those things. Because more than often, a lot of press releases are banking on the fact that you feel that way. And they will use extremely difficult jargon. And you're going to be like... I have no clue what it means, but I'm going to copy paste that word and put it in my article. So refrain from doing that because more than often it's just a superlative that's going to be like, you know, magnanimous and super fragilistic or whatever, all those stuff. So ask those questions. Uh, you know, it's like explain it to them 
person with uh, with the least what was that term they usually say um the, the most dumb person in the room like explain it for that person that's what they say yeah i mean i, I so i i talk about the literacy level so uh, i i say when you write write it for the eighth grader you know like write it for exactly. somebody who is very low literacy level you know yeah, yeah. exactly that, that's exactly the point and don't be afraid to be that person as well if you want to like ask best obviously do your research prior to like don't go up to gadge or foster and ask like oh what do you guys do like that's obviously not a <laughs> nice thing to do but after your research if you still feel like certain jargons don't make sense ask those questions because like i said a lot of it is just complicated jargons that don't really make any sense and it's just you know uh, a lot more fluff than actual uh knowledgeable uh, pieces or uh, you know reports and then uh, obviously provide actionable steps that now this is something that is uh, recently started that is journalists are also taking proactive approach to ask other people as well about what they think are potential solutions you know um there is an interesting and this is a little bit away from sustainability it is more it has more to do with uh, human resource as a sustainable factor but when you do a project within the um, within this region there's something called a bid process now for the bid process you actually do concept design you estimate everything you put budget in you do those cad designs you literally spend like close to 3 4 days of manpower you have 3 4 days of like four five people working on that project and then you submit it and then you cross your fingers and hope that they actually take the project now if they don't take the project whatever work you did literally goes down the drain so there was an interesting conversation about that loss of manpower and loss of like time money um, energy and all of those stuff you know uh, so that is an interesting conversation which does not or did not have a really actionable step or a solution but the conversation kept going within the industry and within 2 years now there is an organization that's thinking about actually creating a list of companies that just take ideas from all architectural firms without really executing or you know paying them back anything so stuff like this really happens and that's because of the conversations that you have so keep having conversation if you think there is a issue within the industry that does not have a solution trust me either there is a replica of it being done somewhere else or there is some innovation or some research into like an ongoing a um, solution or a temporary solution or something of that sort so always look to those and add those as a potential ones now you have to make sure that you can't uh, you can't be biased you can't be like you know oh if you hate uh, kfc then buy mcdonalds clearly i'm a mcdonalds fan um but yeah you can't be that person you can't promote another brand or anything but you can indirectly talk about the research that is being done uh, has a potential guidance for whoever the reader is because as much as you treat the reader being like you know the lowest uh, the person with the lowest literacy rate you should also treat the person with respect because they are giving you your time by reading your article and you need to give them information and that is uh, that is your onus right so that's effective storytelling multimedia again uh, there are multiple examples now i've just put in three the guardians the polluter series is a great one uh by the way massive fan of podcasts uh sabar sir <laughs> knows that as well um so literally the great thing about pos- podcasts is you can actually and i think now a lot of uh, journalists uh, you know uh, here do it as well you can get like recordings from across the world and get quotes from experts not just within the region you can go international you can find like the randomest person and they are more approachable when you do a podcast because not everybody loves to be in front of the camera or wants to be in front of the camera and in those cases um also when you're making controversial statements and they want to stay anonymous then it's a great way to get those quotes and podcasts are absolute uh bests when it comes to storytelling so yeah the guardians the polluter series is one um it has interactive graphics uh my personal favorite is also vox so if you have seen vox videos they literally merge storytelling um you know with this sort of like nice story uh, like voice modulation and graphics and then uh, video and all of it together like it's one of the most amazing things especially if you are interested in 
um, in political or human rights issues. Borders, the particular series called Borders is absolutely fantastic. It's a man literally going to uh, some of the craziest borders and interacting with locals. And, you know, it's all about that different perspectives. He's not sitting uh, in a uh, in a room talking to the person with the biggest coat He's actually literally talking to the end user, and that's what gives it a different perspective. So that's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, with regards to climate or a sustainability conversation, you have NPR's Climate Connections as well. That's a podcast, really good. If you're interested um, in your when you're stuck in traffic in Dubai, podcasts are the best thing to go. So, and then the New York Times Carbon Casualties is also a great one. So you can check out those ones as well. And then, so more or less, again, this is providing context. Don't assume your reader knows everything. They might not. Even if you are talking about the most common thing, explain it. That's why even now when you read a newspaper, RTA is Road and Transport, Road Transport Authority, like they spell it out for you. Because always make sure you're giving context to what you're talking about. You can talk about the most pressing issue and people will have absolutely no idea if you don't give the right context. And also localize it. Always don't look towards international stories. If you're looking to an international story or an international idea, think about how it can be implemented in your local circumstance or like within this region as well. And maybe chances are there is someone replicating something similar. Talk to that person and figure out how they're doing it for this region. <clears throat> so that's the lo local context part of it. And then collaboration. Always talk to multiple people. Even if it is the architecture and design industry, talk to someone in construction, MEP, even data scientist, because again, they have an immense role to play in, you know, sort of coming up with these reports, et cetera. So talk, talk to like everyone associated within that industry and not necessarily even academics are again, an other absolutely great source of information. So touch base with them as well. See um, fairs, if you go to local fairs, there are, you know, people within certain stands who might be very small um, in their presence there, but might be having the next big idea. So don't go to the one that, don't go to the stall that everybody is visiting because chances are you're going to hear a lot about that in the coming days. So go to the ones that are maybe less looked at. Dubai Design Week is coming up. So that's a great opportunity if you want to. And their uh, theme um, for this year is actually about all about sustainability, being one with nature, etc. So it's a great opportunity to check that out as well. They have a lot of industry panel talks, they get a lot of experts from outside, if you can get a one on one with them, really good to like, sort of help you understand the concept as well, if nothing else, if not for a story just to understand. And then hands on opportunity, literally, it's all about you talking to, you know, just going out there and having those conversations. Do not expect to sit and just get information because chances are if you are that person, people will label you as that person and they will be more than happy to just give you a press release and reserve the exclusives for someone else. So make connections in this industry, in this region. Networking is the most important thing. It helps you a lot because there have been multiple times where you have to sort of, even after you put up a story and maybe the interviewee said something that they shouldn't have said. Chances are, if your relationship is good with them, they'll come back to you and say, could you please like, help us like not take that down? Instead, we'll give you the exclusive on this or that or something else, you know? So think about it. If it is, there have been instances where certain journalists will say, no, I've put it up. I'm not going to take it down. But those are also the journalists who then end up with no other stories later on because that's a bridge that's burned and people become a little bit more. And in this region, it's especially very, because it's really small and because everyone knows everyone, just be really careful and make as many con connections as you can because, um, yeah, they will always come back to you with uh, opportunities, queries, angles, etc. And that's it. So that was basically an overview of uh, what I think uh, about the industry as well. Now, like I said, my uh, journey and my career has primarily been in this industry with the architecture and design. And I think it's one of the best sectors to be in right now because this region, it's it's crazy. You have massive amount of people coming in from, um, you know, I spoke to one of the European brands and uh, Italian brands to be specific. And he said, there was a time when we did not regard the UAE, UAE as a market. Like, not even a region, but a market itself, you'll be like, oh, the Middle East region. Like, okay, we can look at it. But the top 
exports should go to US, etc. And now it's completely different. It's Saudi first, UAE second, but setting up a base in Saudi and, and setting up a base in Dubai, it has its own like challenges, etc. But that's where they are uh, focused on. Every big brand, you know, is looking to be here. So it's best time to be a journalist as well. 